speaking on exercise and i already highlighted that in healthy individuals exercise works at the cellular level there is functional synthetolysis and capillary recruitment which contributes to increase blood flow to the exercise muscle so that enough nutrients and oxygen is supplied so this happens through two pathways one is insulin dependent pathway and second is insulin independent but contraction dependent pathways both these pathways they work in healthy individuals and they contribute to glucose uptake by the cells and thereby the blood glucose levels remain in the normal range however in type 2 diabetes lot of issues are there there is capillary rarefaction there is endothelial dysfunction and reduced functional synthetolysis therefore decreased blood flow oxygen and glucose delivery to the muscle insulin dependent pathway is dysfunctional in this people who are having type 2 diabetes but still the direct contraction dependent pathway is intact and therefore it can contribute to glucose delivery to the muscle and that may help in reducing blood glucose levels in this type 2 diabetic individuals with the help of exercise a lot of inter individual differences in acute exercise adaptations in type 2 diabetes particularly during exercise i have already highlighted endothelial dysfunction functional sympatholysis capillary recruitment everything is impaired there is lot of oxidative stress there is mitochondrial dysfunction apart from that there is alteration in brain insulin sensitivity there is uh, changes in prefrontal and hypothalamic cortex there are alterations in sympathetic parasympathetic outflow which contributes to alteration in heart rate and blood risk, uh, blood pressure response to exercise and all this they contribute to maladaptation to exercise in individuals who are having diabetes particularly type 2 diabetes also there are genetic variabilities and various phenotypes with either hyper respond to exercise or they are low responders to exercise types of exercise we all know there are aerobic exercises Uh, which includes walking cycling jogging and swimming and there is resistance training or strength training exercises with free weights or which are being done in the gyms or which are being done with the help of elastic resistance bands uh, flexibility exercises which improve range of motion around joints particularly useful in elderly people or those who are having joint uh, limited joint mobility in long standing diabetes and there are balance exercises which benefit gait and which help in prevention of falls particularly in elderly people multi purpose activities like tai chi and yoga they combine various components of these exercises including flexibility balance and resistance training exercises and they provide additional benefits as far as benefits of exercise is concerned aerobic training is associated with improvement in insulin sensitivity uh, mitochondrial function improves oxidative capacity improves compliance and reactivity of blood vessels lung function immune function and cardiac output increases improves in type 1 and type 2 diabetes both it is associated with improvement in glycemic control decrease in insulin resistance improvement in insulin sensitivity decrease in lipid levels and improvement in endothelial function these are two meta analyses which conclude that type 1 diabetes if you do aerobic exercise that is associated with improvement in hba1c bmi as well as in triglycerides as far as resistance training is concerned there is improvement in muscle mass body composition bone mineral density improves the overall strength and physical functioning improves insulin sensitivity blood pressure lipids and cardiovascular health improves we all know that type 2 diabetes is associated with sarcopenia or low muscle strength it is also an independent risk factor for low muscle strength as well as accelerated decline in muscle strength and functional status with aging therefore resistance training plays an important role in people who are having diabetes to keep their muscles working and to keep their muscle mass intact in type 2 diabetes resistance training is associated with improvement in glycemic control insulin resistance fat mass and fat free mass muscle mass improves blood pressure improves and strength and overall physical functioning improves however the effect of resistance training on glycemic control in type 1 diabetes is still unclear and controversial and mostly this is being associated with a transient rise in blood glucose levels and therefore 
In type 1 diabetes, if you want to combine resistance training exercise along with aerobic exercise, there is enough evidence to say that first you have to do a resistance training exercise that will result in marginal elevation in your blood glucose level values and then you have to do aerobic exercise which will contribute to fall in blood glucose and that in this case, the risk of post-exercise hypoglycemia in type 1 individuals will be low if you do resistance training first and then follow it with aerobic exercise. The stretching exercises which improve range of motion around joints and flexibility but it has got no impact on glycemic control and balance training it can reduce falls by improving balance and gait. Even in people who are having neuropathy, you can use this balance training exercises to decrease the risk of falls. This is the latest 2022 consensus statement from the American College of Sports Medicine for exercise physical activity in individuals with type 2 diabetes. It is like almost all organizations, they agree that minimum 150 to 300 minutes per week of moderate intensity or 75 to 150 minutes per week of vigorous activity of aerobic exercise <clears throat> without not more two consecutive days between bouts of activity. Resistance training two to three days per week but never on consecutive days. It should be 10 to 15 repetitions per set, one to three sets per type of specific exercise. Flexibility exercises should be around more than two to three days per week and balance exercises should be more than two to three days per week or more. And whenever you are designing an exercise plan for your patient, then you have to follow the fit principle. That is type of exercise, frequency of exercise, intensity, and timing of exercise that you have to tell your patients whenever you are prescribing them or you are giving them an exercise prescription. Only giving an advice about physical activity will not do justice. You need to enroll them in a structural exercise training plan that will contribute to better as far as blood pressure is concerned or glycemic control is concerned. This is an, a meta-analysis of variety of trials which suggests that structured exercise training is better in lowering blood pressure both systolic and diastolic in diabetic individuals as compared to physical activity advice only and the same is being that as far as HbA1 reduction is concerned that structured combination exercise both resistance and aerobic when they are combined in a structured exercise training and also it is more than 150 minutes per week then it is associated with greater benefit in HbA1c to the tune of 0.9 percent reduction. Whether timing of exercise affects blood glucose values or not, there is now upcoming concept and this is a small trial, randomized crossover trial in 11 men with type 2 diabetes on insulin without any, not on insulin, without any systemic illness where the high intensity interval training was done in the morning and in the afternoon and to surprise it was shown that afternoon training was more efficacious in improving blood glucose levels in this kind of people who are having type 2 diabetes and morning exercise was associated with a deleterious effect on increasing blood glucose values. However, this is a very small trial but it gives you a hint that if you do a short high intensity interval training in the afternoon that will have a better effect on your 24 hour blood glucose com profile as compared to when you do it in the morning. Why do we require individualization? Because exercise like diet, like pharmacotherapy, like insulin and everything, you need to individualize exercise also. Apart from age, strength, power, speed, aerobic capacity, movement evaluation, injury history and physical limitations which affect exercise plan for every individual in case of a diabetic, age of a patient, sex of a patient, type of diabetes, duration of diabetes, various comorbidities which are there with diabetes and various diabetes complications, they have an impact on the exercise plan for a given individual. And therefore, you need to individualize exercise according to the various factors uh, uh, of a patient who is sitting in front of you. Pre-exercise health evaluation is not mandatory for asymptomatic individuals who are receiving diabetes care consistent with guidelines who are following a proper diabetes plan and who wish to begin low to moderate intensity physical activity, you need not to subject them for a pre-exercise stress testing. Those who wish to start with 
vigorous intensity exercise or resistance training exercise or who are having multiple risk factors or various other factors then you need to subject them to exercise stress testing before <clears throat> giving them an exercise plan of vigorous intensity training. These are the various people who will require exercise training. Uh, this is as per the American College of Sports Medicine 2022 consensus statement. However, this is variable and you have, need to, you have to individualize. But people who are having long-standing diabetes, who are having hypertension, dyslipilipia, multiple CV factors in the form of cigarette smoking, who are having diabetes complications in the form of retinopathy, microalbuminuria, then you need to subject them to exercise stress testing before prescribing them an appropriate exercise plan. Apart from pre-exercise stress testing, blood glucose monitoring is must for every diabetic person who is engaged in exercise or whom you are suggesting a different kind of exercise plan. If the blood glucose is more than 250, then you should not begin exercise or there are urinary ketones, then individual should not exercise and that is uh, the instruction which is to be given particularly to type 1 individuals who are engaging in sports or other activities you have to tell them that if blood glucose is on the higher side or urine ketones are present then exercise is to be uh, avoided same way they should hydrate themselves properly by drinking adequate fluids for people who are using insulin or sulfonylurea the risk of hypoglycemia is there and therefore when they are doing a prolonged activity they should carry some rapid acting carbohydrate snack with them and they should consume it during that activity or after activity to decrease the risk of hypoglycemia which generally occur following an bout of aerobic exercise. The special conditions or complications of diabetes and their impact on exercise for people who are having diabetic retinopathy, they have to avoid high intensity activities, activities which hold which require breath holding like weight lifting, isometric exercises, resistance training exercises. Also, they should avoid activities that lower the head because that will increase the uh, pressure inside the blood vessels in the uh, eye. Like yoga and gymnastics are to be avoided in these people. And if they are not able to uh, undergo a stress test, then they can use that rating of perceived exertion to monitor exercise intensity and they can do a light to moderate activity with a rating of perceived exertion to the tune of 10 to 12 on a 60 to 20 scale. It is contraindicated uh, for people who are having proliferative or unstable retinopathy or recent retinal uh, coagulation or other recent surgical eye treatment to avoid any kind of exercise and you have to consult an ophthalmologist for specific restrictions and limitations in case of severe retinopathy. Autonomic neuropathy, there is an increased risk of hypoglycemia, abnormal response of blood pressure as well as heart rate to exercise as well as abnormal thermoregulation which may occur following exercise and there is increased risk of tachycardia and that for the exertional intolerance is there in people who are having autonomic neuropathy and therefore rather than heart rate the rating of perceived exertion should be used to limit the exercise intensity in these people who are having autonomic neuropathy. Same way for peripheral neuropathy you have to avoid weight bearing exercises particularly walking on uneven surfaces non weight bearing exercises like cycling chair exercises or swimming may be more appropriate and you have to take proper care of your feet uh, particularly in people who are having moderate or severe neuropathy and if they are exercising regularly kidney disease you have to avoid resistance training exercises or high intensity aerobic exercise which are associated with increase in blood pressure also exercises which require breath holding they are to be avoided and therefore in this category of patients like to moderate intensity aerobic activity may be okay or balance uh, balance exercises or stretching exercises may be okay for these individuals and same applies also for hypertension individuals particularly those who are having uncontrolled blood pressure. I will just touch upon recommendations for physical activity by Diabetes Canada. This is 2018. We all know ADA recommendations. Almost all organizations, they agree that at least uh, 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity aerobic exercise spread over at least three days of week is must for every type 2 diabetic individual with no more than two consecutive days without exercise to improve glycemic control. Lesser amounts of exercise can be done, but it will not be having the same beneficial impact on glycemic control. 
interval training can be recommended particularly if the people they want to improve their cardiorespiratory fitness and this is particularly in type 1 individuals to reduce the risk of hypoglycemia which can follow a period of aerobic exercise so before doing an aerobic exercise they may do a short period of vigorous exercise or high intensity interval training they can do a short bout and then they can do aerobic exercise to decrease the risk of hypoglycemia which may follow aerobic exercise resistance exercise at least twice a week and preferably three times per week and this should be individualized and it should be under the supervision by an exercise specialist physical activity goals are must but at the same time sedentary lifestyle or the time spent in sedentary activities should be minimized and people should periodically break up long periods of sitting and should stand and walk around in between the sitting every 20 minutes of sitting you have to walk up you have to walk and uh, you have to stand and walk for few minutes specific exercise goals and problem solving should be provided to all the people who are having diabetes step count monitoring with a pedometer or accelerometer can be a beneficial in people tracking their physical activity and motivating them to do better with physical activity as far as hypoglycemia and type 1 diabetes is concerned there are few suggestions by diabetes canada guidelines that reduce the bolus dose of insulin that is most active at the time of exercise significantly reduce or suspend basal insulin for the exercise duration if the activity is less than 45 minutes then you have to suspend and lower the basal rate overnight after exercise by around 20 percent carbohydrate consumption should be increased during and after exercise as per the activity and if maximal intensity sprints at the start of exercise periodically during the activity or at the end of exercise may help in reducing hypoglycemia in this type 1 diabetic children and adolescents perform resistance exercise before aerobic exercise as i have already Older individuals, I think you have to assess them uh, with proper history and if required you to tell them to undergo exercise stress testing and then devise uh, uh, exercise plan. But this again requires individualization because uh, here the chronological age does not matter. It is the biological age which matters most. And structured exercise programs are must for type 2 diabetic because they have got a better impact on glycemic control on CBD respectors and overall physical fitness. As far as type 1 diabetes is concerned, its part recommendations are there. They say that exercise is a cornerstone. Minimum uh, recommended 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity per day for children and adolescents with both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Increase overall risk of hypoglycemia during, shortly after and up to 24 hours. However, I have already told that high intensity is not associated with risk of hypoglycemia. So you need not to uh, require insulin dose adjustment, but aerobic activity definitely you need to reduce the insulin dose to decrease the risk of hypoglycemia. If the people they have got hypoglycemia in the preceding 24 hours or past history of hypoglycemia with exercise within 24 hours, then it is a temporary contraindication to physical activity in this kind of individuals. Same way, hyperglycemia with ketonemia, exercise should be avoided. So the key messages are exercise is important, not only for diabetics, for every human being. It improves glycemic control, body composition, cardiorespiratory wellness, physical functioning in people with type 2 diabetes, type 1 diabetes or even pre-diabetes. Lifestyle modification, including exercise training, is a main strategy in diabetes prevention as per DPP program. Multiple benefits are there on blood glucose, lipids, body weight, body composition, blood pressure, as well as there are mental health benefits. It reduces anxiety, it improves mood, it reduces depression, improves sleep quality, and therefore combination of aerobic and resistance training is a component of any treatment plan for every individual who is having diabetes. And as to avoid prolonged sitting, Step monitor may be beneficial in tracking physical activity. At least 150 minutes per week of aerobic exercise combined with two sessions per week of strength training is must for every type 2 diabetic individual. However, if they are not able to reach that goal, smaller amounts, still they will provide some health benefits. So whatever you do, 
whatever type of exercise whatever type amount of exercise the person is able to do they should engage in that kind of exercise so exercise is must for every diabetic however one size does not fit all and i have already highlighted various factors which affect the uh, exercise plan for a diabetic individual and considering all these factors you need to individualize and make them exercise regularly so they can live longer happier and healthier thank you very much